So I'm going to talk about some of the things that preceded today. And maybe we'll get into verse 28, but we definitely want to begin to look at some of the things that preceded it because that that verse 28 has often been used as a, gir, a, a verse of comfort. I know I use it all the time. And, and it's it's more comforting that I came to find out now. And it's something that I want to uh, be able to share with all of the saints that we can uh, rejoice together in what God has granted us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. But with that being said, we're going to look at verse 24 here. Look at verse 24 in Romans, the 8th chapter. It says, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what? You know, every time somebody sees the term <coughs> saved in the Bible, what do they often think about? Spiritual, spiritual salvation. Spiritual salvation, right? The salvation from the from sin and all of its uh, the issues, the, the, the acquisition of eternal life. But in this case, it's not talking about that. Okay? This particular area of scripture is talking about we're saved by hope based upon our day-to-day -day anxiety and our day-to-day -day, um, result of the suffering that's going on around us. You know, we're saved from the anguish. You don't have to have that trepidation. You're saved from that. That God has excused you from having to be in this turmoil about life's conditions and all the things that are going on. How do I know that? Because I looked at what precedes it. See, you stay. You have to stay in context. This salvation is in context to those things that are troubling us in this particular case. We looked a little further back at verse 18. It says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. So it's talking about these sufferings that we are dealing with on a present basis. And by, uh, by virtue of what we've already looked at, it's talking about this suffering that we have in where? Present time. In present time, where at? Life. In our bodies. In our bodies. You see that? Mm -hmm. So now this brings it to a physical thing, right? Mm -hmm. He's making a reference to this salvation that we have already that we don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about that you're in a corrupt body and that body is going to continue to be, that co co continue to corrupt. You ever, I think Pastor Scott talked about a couple of weeks ago. He said, what if we just continue to live in these bodies? Think about a hundred years, you know. hundred years, you see, they start falling down. Think about 200. Think about 300. You know, this, the body is going to corrupt, so it's just going to fall. It's, it's just like everything else. Water hit, rock, water hit a rock long enough, what's going to happen? It erodes. It breaks it down. So these bodies are breaking down. They're corruptible. So we don't have to worry about the effects of corruption on this body. Why? It's going to happen. Anyway. It's going to happen, but what is our hope? We're going to get a new one, right? So this is what the Word of God says. So that's what say, our hope saves us from the worry of the corruption of the body. So it goes on and says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. What does this mean to us? What comfort does that bring me right now? Right now, I'm not going to get tore up about having some type of illness or going to the doctor and he giving me a bad doctor report. That's not going to tear me up. That's, that's, I, don't, I don't plan on being here forever. And guess what? Everybody dies of something. Tell the truth. How many people you know died 100% healthy? It, something that heart stops even if you get hit by a car or whatever something begins to happen in the body where the body shuts down right. the fact of the matter is is that we have to take a look at God's perspective we're in this body but this body really is not our home anymore this is what we're using to, uh, to, to draw out our existence on earth but this is really not our we, feel, we realize this is a temporary condition We've been transitioned already out of this particular existence because this is a reminder of our Adamic connection. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. You really have a new existence in Christ that is not entailed in this body. And when you begin to understand that and really begin to grasp that, it will disconnect you from all the infirmities that generally you'll see that people have. And when people begin to grasp and understand that, they won't have that sorrow and that that destitute and that woe is me that you see so often in society with age. I mean, if you get older, things are going to happen. You're not after you get a certain age, things don't start getting stronger and more, you know, vibrant. They start breaking down. Why, when I get up in the morning, there's always a new ache or pain somewhere? 
It always really always Every, it's <laughs> always something new. I mean, I, I mean, you can count on it. it's like, man, what is that? The other day I was getting up and I, it was like a child horse in my calf. From what? I haven't done anything different, but I really had to. I had to work that out before I had to kind of loosen it up, massage it out because it was going to be a problem if I really. Where did that come from? I've never had that before. These are the type of things that these bodies are going to do, and we have to get suited for it. And it seems to be a small thing when we make uh, when we make a, a, a reference to something like as minor as that, but it's important because this is something that deals with most individuals as they get older and they don't have the right doctrine, their answer is not the comfort that the scriptures give as it pertains to this. Their answer is that God, I've seen God in the Bible do miraculous healings. So their answer to these particular situations is that they want God to heal them. Forget everything else. If I believe hard enough, if I send for the elders of the church, if they anoint me with oil, I can get the healing that I see in the Bible. And if God did it for him in time past, he'll do it for me. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he healed him in time past, he's going to deal with me. The only reason we have not is because we ask not. And these are the type of things that you have over there. Don't you tell me that God don't heal. He's a healer. He is a healer. You know, and you'll get into that type of conversation. And that is really why a lot of individuals don't grasp the comfort that is in this because they refuse to even acknowledge this because their only answer to frailty and sickness is that God heals. Yep. But this is not what this is talking about. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with what? Patience. Wait for it. This is a term that we want to look at as it pertains to our Christian life. Then do we with patience from the time you believe Somebody will call your cell phone <laughs> when you are taking on Facebook Live. <laughs> to the day your hope is fulfilled. From the time you believe to the day your hope is fulfilled. is what this is defined as. Patience. From the moment you believe to the day that your hope is fulfilled, that is what patience is. Look over here at Romans, the fifth chapter. We're very familiar with this, but this is all coming together. You have to really understand what it is. Look what this says, Romans 5. Some of you are familiar with where we're going here. Romans 5 and 3. And not only so, but we glory in what? Tribulation. I want you to absorb the words here. I mean, sometimes we read past words and really don't really grasp them to the extent that they can really bring us comfort. This is something that is going to tie into other things that we see over and over and over and over again. It's telling us that we glory in tribulations. Now, it's just not that we go through tribulations, okay? Because tribulations are going to come the moment you believe any man that is going to live godly in Christ Jesus is going to do what? Suffer, Suffer persecution. Suffer persecution. So for the moment you believe, tribulations is going to come. That's a part of the package. So the fact that tribulations comes, it says we glory in tribulations. Look what it says. This is a work. And we've talked about this before. This really... It's a part of what we're talking about. It's not the main thing, but it's all, you have to understand the backdrop of this. You have to understand the principle that's set here because we're talking about patience. And because we're talking about this term, you need to know everything that goes with patience. Look what it says about patience. Where there's patience, there first must be tribulations. Because tribulation worketh your patience, okay? Now, this is only for the believer. This only applies to the believer's situation. So in other words, I used to hear this um, thing, I believe, that 
uh, somebody from the secular world actually grasped the concept of what was going on there and they began to say if you pray and ask God for patience you better get ready because guess what's coming Tribulation. tribulations right the thing is the only way that this cycle works is if you're a believer if you're not a believer, you don't have any tribulations from this vantage point. This is not the trib the tribulation that is being made reference to is the one that is in opposition to the believer. This is what you have to understand. This is this is our information. This is edification. This is what deals with us as believers. So that if, just because you hear something, you have to know who it's defined to, who's being made reference to. A lot of people take the word of God and try to apply it to man's wisdom. And they don't coexist. Or oil, oil, water, and oil doesn't uh, doesn't mix. And neither does godly wisdom and man's wisdom. They are two totally ends of the different ends of the spectrum. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing. Now, this is another issue when we see the word of God. When we talk about this knowing, that means that God has established in His Word that this is a principle that we can stand on every time. We have to know this. This is the truth. This is how this works. Every time. It's never going to fail. Mm -hmm. Look how it works. And uh, knowing that tribulations worketh patience. So now, the fact of the matter is the moment you get saved, tribulations is already there waiting for you. It's already there waiting for you. It comes in different various forms, okay? Mm -hmm. It comes in different various forms. And the purpose for the tribulation is so that you can work your faith against it. Are you going to see? This is the contrast. I want you to understand this. If it, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? Tribulations is coming. There's two ways you can deal with the tribulations. You can either go back to the way you used to deal with things mm -hmm. and try to deal with your tribulations based upon your own way and get nowhere. Or you can deal with tribulations based upon the renewed mind. You put on the word of God and start dealing with things based upon the way God's word says that you deal with them, right? If you do it that way, and only when you do it that way, then the, pro then the process continues. Okay? Tribulation work is patience. Patience experience. You see that? Now you have experience. You only have experience when you deal with the situation based upon the renewed mind. Now you have experience in that particular case. Why is that beneficial? Right, so now you don't have to. You 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 you've mastered that. You got that. You you're through that. Why? What what's some of the ramifications of what the benefit of you going through something and understanding God's word, how God's word worked in a particular area? You can comfort others with it. That's the purpose. The purpose behind you getting victory over certain areas based upon the transformed mind, getting the experience, is so that now I can be a comfort to others based upon my... And it's your testimony. It's your... Brother, I've been through that same thing. I've been through that illness. I've been through that sickness. I've been through that financial destitute. I have had that bad health report. Not just based on secular understanding. Right, right. Based upon the word of God. This is a process that God has in place. It works every time. Tribulation work is patience, patience, experience, and experience leads to what? Hope. See, this is a cycle. So when you see hope, you patience, all of this is in the same. You can't separate. You know what they call this? When something has a, works together, synergistic. Some might even call it systematic. Okay. Okay. You can't break that up. God has designed that this is how this is going to work for us every time. And all we need to do is absorb the word of God renew our mind and deal with the situations based upon the way the renewed mind is supposed to deal with the situation. And then that hope will be there. We'll be walking in the manner that God pleases. So I, I just want to bring that in because we want to go somewhere else with this conversation. Okay, Let's go back to uh, <clears throat> Romans 8 here. I don't know how far we're going to get, but we're going to definitely deal with this. 
So what I'm telling you is that, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience do what? So I'm telling you that patience is basically you waiting for your hope to manifest itself. And in the process of you waiting for your hope to manifest itself, you're living out your Christian life. You live out your Christian life because you study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I beseech you, brother, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable service, right? So now, um, the next portion of that, and the reason I have to reiterate these verses because all this thing, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed how? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God has designed that we prove what his good, perfect, and acceptable will is while we're in these bodies. What we have to recognize is that the moment we trusted in what God was doing, the moment we trusted the gospel, God began to change us instantly. A change happened in our life, whether we wanted to be an active participant in it or not. God has made a change in our life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, whether he recognizes it or not. And I can say that because you, if, if you've gone to a, a garage sale and you told somebody the gospel and they believe that gospel, but they never went to a church that began to in, indoctrinate them in the proper way, they became a new creature that day. Amen. But did they make any progress in that new creature? No, no he's, he's still a new creature. God is still waiting and he's trying to beseech him and he wants him to move forward and grow in the knowledge of who he is. But the fact of the matter is he can't make a move because he doesn't have the renewed mind. But that's not God's will for us. God's will is that we prove his good and acceptable purpose. So let's go a little further. We're going to see some things start lining up here. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now look what happens is. Where does the spirit come in at? The moment we believe. Now the spirit. Why is that so important? Because look at Romans 7 and 5. Romans 7, 5 and 7, 6. I want you to begin to know these verses like why, they, why they're there. This is the thing. Why it says the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Why is the Spirit helping our friends? Because before we believed, we didn't have the Spirit. When we believed, the Spirit took over. The Spirit is leading it, is guiding us, is doing everything. But the thing that we do contrary to the Spirit when we don't, uh, 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 to, don't render to the Spirit, we grieve, we grieve and we quench the Spirit. So look what it says here. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit, fruit unto death, right? But look at verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve how? In newness of spirit. In newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Now, I always used to contrast that almost with the, the Old Testament and that type of thing. But no, it's, not, it's saying that you're now in the newness of the spirit. That's what happened the moment you believed. You went out of the flesh, and now you're in the newness of the spirit. Why, is this, why does it call it the newness of the spirit? That's the thing we have to Why is it the newness of the spirit to a person that didn't believe? Because if any man be in Christ, all things, all things pass away. Behold, all things. You never had the spirit before. You, the, from the moment you never had the spirit before, the moment you believed the spirit that was infused in your life, and now God is leading you by his spirit. Right, right. That is your new position. That is God. That's where God has you at. That's where God has positioned you at. And that, and, and that truth is important for us to understand because a lot of individuals struggle about still being in the flesh. You need to know that your new position is in the spirit. Whether you that person that believed that gospel at that garage sale, they're in the spirit, whether they know it or not. They may be grieving it or quenching it. But most likely they are if they're not getting sound doctrine. But the fact of the matter is they're in the spirit. This is the verbiage and the terms that we need to know and understand so that people won't get confused to think that there's something still old about them when God says that all things are new about them. Now, this is our introductory stuff here. We're getting to, I'm trying to build up to get to verse 28. But there's some things about going to 28 that we need to know so that everything will line up the way it needs to line up. Now, I don't know how much time I need to take here, but until I really get the understanding, uh, get to see that we are where we need to be, that's how much time we'll take. Likewise, the Spirit also 
helpeth our infirmities. Now, I'm, I'm not a big person for grief. Because I realized the Bible was written in what? It, for us, it was written in what? English. <clears throat> and that English that it was written in has words that fully describe what we need to know. This term infirmity just doesn't deal with illness. This terms deal with the fact that anything that you do in your life that is a shortcoming, you can't, it, it deals with the fact that that we're futile. Okay. Look at look at Romans uh, Romans the eighth chapter. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected him in the same hope. That futility, that vanity is that futility. Okay? So in other words, what we're saying here is that we recognize because the position that we are in, especially in these fleshly bodies, that there are things that we definitely cannot do. And what God has already let us know, that I know that you could not do them. Guess what? I've done them for you. And I'm doing them for you. It takes us out of the equation. So when you see infirmities there, it's not a, it's not a case of a sickness. It's, a, it's the matter that the only person who could fulfill this for you is Christ. Flesh so is weak. The flesh is weak. So anytime we cannot serve God in the flesh, and this is why Paul talks about in Romans, the seventh chapter, the good I would I find not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. The fact of the matter is the only issue, the only individual that could manifest the, the things that, that need to be done for us is God. So when we see infirmities, these shortcomings, it's not illness, it's in every, every case of our life, we cannot do what is pleasing to God. It takes the spirit to do it. Why is this, why is this trying to be such a uh, somewhat of a... Um, something almost heard new for the first time because oftentimes people still think that they're helping God when they're doing things in their Christian life. And the fact of the matter is that God doesn't want anything from us. He Amen. wants it to be all the operation of God. Amen. And when you're doing it, sometimes you can even mistakenly take the credit for it, but what you're really supposed to do is give God the credit for it because it's not you doing it, it's Christ in you that's really doing these Amen. things. So when I'm talking about this issue of infirmities, it's almost, I'm getting tongue-tied talking about it because when I recognize what was on that page, God is really saying that you can't do nothing. Without me, you cannot do anything. All of that is still true. It's really me through you. And this is why it says it over and over again. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We dismiss ourselves. We take ourselves out of the way and recognize that anything good coming out of us is the fact that Christ is living through us. So any infirmity that we have, Christ shores it up. That's why in Rome, in, 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 in 2 Corinthians the uh, 12, I mean 2 Corinthians, which when Paul is talking about the infirmity of the flesh, he says um, he prays to the Lord three times, mm -hmm. and he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is what? Is made, made perfect in your weakness. And that's where we, God really wants us to be at. He wants us to recognize that there's nothing you can do. I'm going to do all of this for you. Yeah, it's, almost, it's the same way it was with Israel. You remember when um, Moses came off the mountain, and just like, the, uh, the, just like Pastor Scott talked about a few weeks ago, he comes off the mountain. Before he gets off the mountain, they're breaking half the things, but half the things that he said didn't want them to do, but yet and still, they say, we can do it. Whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do it. Not recognizing you can't do it. Less profit of nothing. Absolutely, and that's what we have to know. So all I'm, I'm, I'm really building up this information right now to really get you to the point. So when we get to Rush 28, we're going to say, like, man, we can erase all of that out of the issue that we thought we were doing. Because even within grace circles, there's still some things that we kind of patting ourselves on the back about. 
And we're totally out of the equation in every manifestation of life. In our physical man, in our emotional man, in our spiritual man, everything is taken out of life. Everything that's done is Christ. That's why we give thanks in because everything that's done for us is done up for us in Christ. And we're going to see that in Scripture. It doesn't make enough to, difference to say it, but we're going to see it in Scripture that God really helps us with our infirmities. And our infirmities cast itself on every plane of our life. Anything that we think that we're doing, we have a problem. You understand what I'm saying here? If you think you're doing it, only what you do for Christ is going to last. So you have to really understand this. Look what he say here. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we are. Now this is something I make a big deal about as well. You're living your life, right? You, you got enough sense to know what you need to pray for and what you don't need to pray for. You know, only you know what's going on in your life, right? Come on. I know some people that can pray the house down. Now I've seen, you know, you see those people, right? Oh, they can pray a mile. Oh, that was a powerful prayer. Oh, that was a powerful prayer. Oh, you've seen it? Some people pray they the greater orators and their words just flow and it's almost like a poem. It's just poetic. It just, just flows together very well. The word of God is letting us know. This is a, God is really humbling me right He humbled me right here. When I seen that and really understood what that means, you mean to tell me all the times I think I'm really praying it? You don't know what to pray for as you are. You know why? Because as spiritual as we think we are, we're still looking out these fleshly eyes. There's something, whatever is around that corner, I cannot see it. So it could be somebody stay, waiting to hit me in the head with a bat out here. I'm not going to pray that, Lord, please don't let that person hit me in the head with the bat when I leave out this room. Because I don't even know there's somebody out there waiting for me with a bat. Right. So I'm praying for all this other stuff, right? right. So I go outside, hey, hey, man, praise God. Praise, 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 praise. Boom! You didn't see, see that, huh? I, did, it's, I missed that. Because I'm basing my prayers on my limited understanding. Right, right. And the other portion of it is... Is that God, well, I got to get to that. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves there. But the fact of the matter is that this is something that in large part, individuals and Christians, and I was just using that as an analogy, we're not, we're not talking about that so much. But in large part, individuals of Christianity, I mean, in, in Christendom, perceive that they know so much that they can dictate what needs to be prayed for and they got the schematic. In fact, this is another thing. They have, they have a lot of churches that the pastor gives the vision of the church, right? And, and you need a vision, you know, the, the, the vision in the Old Testament is like, without a vision, what? People the people perish. So they're using that understanding, you know. You, you, you need some direction. You need some direction. But you have to understand that for the most part, God is going to have to do the directing. So you need to stay fluid. You know, you can put some things in place. But you need to stay fluid because God ultimately is going to make sure what, what he desires to happen in his church, the body of Christ, is going to manifest itself. So don't get so caught up in what do we're going to do this one time this way. No. God might say, no, you're going to do it this way. So you have to stay fluid as it pertains to what God's going to do. So when we talk about likewise, the spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we are. Isn't that a beautiful truth? When God, Look what it says. As we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings that what? Cannot be heard. And this is something else I'm going to tell you. When we say this, that the Spirit maketh intercession for us. Now, this is how the Spirit maketh intercession for us. Now, a lot of people have said that this area of the Scripture is why it's so important for us to pray in tongues. Yeah. If you don't have a prayer language, you're missing it. You have, you because see, the devil is going to is going to block your prayer. So you need to be able to pray in tongues because that pray in tongues, he don't understand it, and that gets to God. So a lot of times we're missing our blessing because we ain't praying in tongues, and that tongue is an extra level of spirituality that connects. It gives you a direct connection to God. So your, your words go, and, and Satan blocks them. He blocks your words because he can intercept. But if you pray in tongues, it gets directly to God because you're praying to God, right? You've heard this before? Yes. Amen. So, uh, and this, this is the truth. This is, what, this is what is out there. But see, when we read the scripture, we find out that that's not true. The word of God says, look at what it says here. Mm -hmm. But the spirit maketh intercession for, uh, it says, it says, 
But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be. What? Uttered. What does utter mean? Spoken. Spoken. That means that the Spirit maketh intercession with groanings that don't come out of your mouth. Utterance is something, anything that comes out of your mouth. Uh, 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 that's utterance, a sound that comes out of your mouth. The Holy Spirit makes an intercession for you without sound. When the Holy Spirit is interceding on your behalf, He's making intercession for you without sound. There's no verbiage there. There's no type of, no like of sound that can proceed out of your mouth. That's the Holy Spirit making intercession for you. And it happens every time. Um, every time a person believes, God allows the Holy Spirit to intercede on his behalf for the rest of his life. From the time he believes to the time his hope is fulfilled. And it's for a purpose. God has a design purpose in all of our lives. And he has the Holy Spirit that's right there designing and, and architecting our and, and, and the schematics of everything that we need as it pertains to this life that we lead in Christ. And, and he that searches the hearts, verse 27, and he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Who searches the hearts? The Lord God. You, now you see what happened. That big spirit seeps down into our little spirit and make intercession based upon some things we don't even know. God the Father, the Spirit makes intercession for us based on things that we don't know. Just like I was making a reference to just a moment. And the search uh, and, and, and searcheth the hearts, knoweth knoweth what the what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. You never have to worry about are you in the will of God if you believe the gospel at one point in your life. God is behind the scenes, so to speak, because we don't see him. I'm saying he's behind the scenes and he's very present in, in essence. Right, right. But the fact of the matter is God is orchestrating everything in the life of a believer. The moment you believe, he begins to make intercession for you according to the will of God. So God, you're in God's will because you believe the gospel. Right. That's all that was required. That's all that was required. So now the intercession that he's making on your behalf is based upon nothing other than the will of God. You don't have, man, I wonder if I'm in the will of God. I wonder if I'm doing what God would have me to do. I wonder, I really wonder. You know, I want to be smack dab right in the center of the will of God. I want to be right, you see that? I'm going to write in the bullseye in the, you don't never have to worry. See, yeah, these are the type that. of prayers that yeah. people are talking about that the word of God is clearly let us know. That's not my... I don't have to concern myself with that. How do I know that that's the case? Because it's the operation of God that's making sure that I'm in the will of God. All I have to do is submit and allow Christ to live through me and everything else will take its shape. Everything else is going to line up. But that extra part of worrying, trying to figure out, most people in Christendom waste 80% of their time trying to figure out what God's will in their life is. Right. What do God want me to do? But where do I fit in? How do I? All you have to do is believe and allow the Spirit of God to make intercession for you, and it will take you where all the places you need to go if you're submitting to the will of God. That's the thing with us. See, the major issue with us, in order for us to line up with this, in order for us to line up with this, in time past, in order for them to line up with it, they had to obey the law. That was the part of the covenant they had to do. In order for us to line up with it, that's why I always go over here to Romans 12 and 1. Look what it says here. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is what? Your reasonable. The reason I say that, the reason that verse is so important to us, because that's what you and I have to do if, in fact, we are going to be uh, are going to really allow to maximize what the will of God in our life is. Right, right. And it's easier said than done because it's easy to say it, right? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, let's talk about that for just a moment because that's so important. Presenting your body as a li living sacrifice is recognizing that you have a direction that you want your life to go into. Right? 
You've had things that you've had planned in your life the whole time. That, and, 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 and I'm not talking about getting married, right. getting a house, and all, you know, that, that's, that's outside of that. But you have a direction for your life that you thought you had a course that it was supposed to take, right? Mm -hmm. Then you got saved one day. Mm -hmm. The moment you got saved, guess what happened? New direction. New di you got rerouted. Mm -hmm. You got rerouted. Now the things in your life are going to be based upon the will of God. And I don't care how much good moral character you have with that. Now I'm paraphrasing a lot because I'm still in the introduction phase of my message. Right. But what I'm telling you is that even when Jesus Christ was in his earthly ministry, you know what he said when he, was, when he, was, when he came as a man, um, came in sinful flesh? You know what he told the Father? Not my will, thine be done. Amen. That's it. He said, not my will, but thine will be done. There's a will that the natural body has that is contrary to the will of God. And you have to have the spiritual and that you have to have the spiritual ability to understand God's word to allow his will to be manifested rather than the desires that you want to do in your life. Because they're going to bump heads every time. They're going to bump heads. And that's what we really, if you want to maximize your ability for God to utilize you, you have to begin to recognize, well, is this me or is this God right here? Well, okay. I know what God would rather have, so I'm going to flow with that particular situation in my life. And those are the type of things that will really allow you to maximize God's usage in your life. And he that, okay, and he that searches the hearts, Knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So now we know that that's according to the will of God. Good. We have a little time to get into verse 28. Now, with all of that being said, right, we get down to verse 28. Now, this is where our message starts. All of that was introductory. I wanted to go over that because there are going to be some phrases and some terms that we'll probably use while discussing this, that I want to at least be fresh on your mind when we begin to talk about some of these things. He starts in verse 28. Now, this is the most comforting verse, of, one of the most comforting verses that I've ever ever heard. And oftentimes when people are going through different trials and, 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 and things in their life, I'll often uh, quote this verse to them. Hopefully that they understand the word of God rightly divided because it's more comforting to a person that understands the word rightly divided versus somebody who does Even people that don't, they can still shake their head yes to this. Verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, like I say, this information here was just an introduction, so to speak. I'm so glad we don't have a lot of the formalities that, that a lot of fellowships have because I really want to make a turn here <clears throat> and deal with this verse. The first part of this verse starts out, it says, and we know. As many times as I looked at this verse and I've studied this verse in this area of scripture, I never really stopped and took the time to recognize that he was saying, and we know. The and is because it was connected to all the things that preceded it. We knowing was not connected to all the things that preceded it. This is something that we want to look at here. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. We often make this statement that our Christian life can what? Not function on the basis of ignorance. Cannot function on the basis of ignorance, right? So there's some things that we need to know. In order for your Christian life to function, in order for it to operate properly, you have to have some knowledge. That's Christ living in you. You can't say that you're really living the Christian life and doing what God would have you to do unless Christ really is living through you. And the only way Christ is going to live through you is if you get the words of Christ in your mind so that you can do the things that Christ would be doing rather than what you would be doing. This particular area right here, it says, and we know that all things work together for good for to them 
that are that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. This verse here is an interdispensational truth that a lot of times it was overlooked. The Apostle Paul lets us know that this has always been the case with God. Look at what it says. We know that all things work together for them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Now, I don't want to go ahead, but we have to often look, just look at the verse. It, it ends with a called according to his purpose. God has an overall purpose, right? But what do we know about God's purpose? Well, let me, let me see if we're all on the same page as far as God's purpose. God's purpose is that he's going to reconcile both heaven Amen. and earth back to himself right. through his son, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and 10. Is that, does, do we agree that that's the purpose of God? Right. Right. So now, he's telling us that all things work together for the good for them, um, for them that love God, for them who are called according to his purpose. So now I know a little something about the purpose of God that the purpose of God branches itself off into two different areas. Did you, do we agree with that? So there's going to be a heavenly purpose and what else? Earthly. An earthly purpose, right? <clears throat> this made me know when I looked at the scriptures that because God had a heavenly purpose and an earthly purpose, and if this is an interdispensational truth, that means that in time past, all things work together for the good for them that love God and were called according. Anytime a person was called according to God's purpose, whether it was in time past, but now, or in ages to come, this should be true about them. That everything in their life is going to work together for the good. Now, see, working together for the good, I don't want to go ahead, working together for the good don't mean that everything seems good to your experience. It works together for the good as it pertains to the will of God. And that's why we have to lock ourselves into what the will of God is because our will, it may not be good. See, it was very discomforting for Jesus Christ to have to go through what he went through in order for God's will to be manifested. So we asked, could this cup be removed from him? Now, I personally believe he didn't care about the physical suffering so much as so many people think. When Jesus Christ was praying and, and sweating blood and different things like that, he wasn't worried about getting um, crucified. That wasn't the issue. His issue was that he didn't want to be separated from the Father. That was ultimately, he knew that well, his ultimate thing is that he was going to be separated from his Father. And that was really what was really painstaking to him. Mm -hmm. So we understand that there's going to be some things in our lives that are going to be contrary to how we want to feel at a particular time, but it's going to work out. It's going to be God working things together for our good, but it's not going to be feeling good to us. We get that? Mm -hmm. So that's something we want to know and understand. And we know that all things work together for good. See, this is something. So now... What are some of these all things? Because this is going to tell me a lot. Joseph being sold into slavery into Egypt. Ooh, that's my that's my text. Don't go no further with that because I'm going there. That's you right on point with that. That's an absolutely where that's that's all of where it, that's that's a great caption. How all things work together because at the end of that, what did he state? They meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. So we see that's where we're going with this. Praise God, we are the same. But what you have to understand that everything that was going through, it was just not spiritual. It was some physical things that God was taking them through, and they weren't comfortable for them. Stoning of Stephen. The stoning of Stephen. It led to something, but all things were working together for good. See, we live in a time that we so we don't. We're talking about being persecuted. Some people were persecuted unto death in time past. We talk about persecuting because when I talk about the grace of God, they laugh at me like you've got some type of cultist doctrine. That's persecution, so to speak. But the real persecution, I mean, people have gone through some real physical 
um, problems just for the sake of the gospel. And we stand here and we just uncomfortable about sharing the gospel with some people that might laugh at you because you're telling people God saves people by simply believing that Christ died for their sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, and then God never takes the salvation away from them. They're saved until the day of redemption. When this person over here is telling them that they got to continue to work goodness and to work righteousness. So we, we, we see that that type of thing, it, it, it kind of like pales in comparison to what some of the, the issues that they dealt with in time past. So what we want to really point out here is that this all things, that it, does it really mean all things or does it mean some things? The word all means all. It means all. So now we have, when we define that, we have to know that it's both physical, because these are really the only areas here, and spiritual. Another area of well, internal Philipp Philippians 2. I believe this here. Okay, look at Philippians 2. Verse 25 to 30. Look what it says. Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and, and a companion in labor and fellow soldier. But your messenger. And he, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was he full of heaviness because that ye have heard that he had been sick. Who was sick? Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus was sick, right? For indeed he was sick, how nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him. And not only, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I'm gonna stop there for time's sake. What happened there? <laughs> he was no longer sick. God. God, healed God healed the Epaphroditus. Did you recognize that? In the dispensation of grace of God, God doesn't heal on promise. God heals based upon His grace and His mercy. But he, he still will heal. So when we, we don't stop praying for God to heal somebody. But the basis on why he will heal them is different. If he does it based upon his mercy, that means he had no obligation to do that. But he did it. So when he does it, what do we do? We give him glory. Thank you. Thank you. I know you didn't have to do that, but you did it. Thank you, Jesus. You did that. So why, we, why do we want to bring that out? Because when we talk about it's all things physical and spiritual, we recognize that it, just because the promise of healing is not in the dispensation of the grace of God, God still can heal based upon the verse. We see it still manifesting itself. It just didn't say by chance he got healed or he gives the credit to the doctors or the medicine or something wow. different. The fact that the healing manifested itself, God got the glory. He said it was from God. He said it was God's mercy extended towards that individual and it caused him to not have to be sorrow, have the sorrow that would come with the illness of his companion not having the opportunity to do it. So we begin to pull out certain things to recognize where the all things lie. And all things lie not only in our spiritual blessings that we receive, but even the spiritual, the physical blessings that manifest themselves in our lives. So when we're looking at all things, we want to definitely make sure we define them as absolutely all things. Absolutely all things when we look at these, because this is very going to be very beneficial when you're trying to be an effectual witness to somebody else. You don't want to limit what God is doing. You don't want to say God is not healing today. Well, God is something. He's not healing on the standard that he healed in time past. He's not saying uh, send the elders of the church and let them lay the hands on the sick and they shall recover. He's not. That's not it. Pray for that healing. It may manifest itself. It may not. But if it does, guess who gets the glory? God gets the glory. So we recognize that. That's the area that we say. So we know that all things work together for good for uh, together, <clears throat> we know that all things work together. And this is a, the next portion of that. We talked about this already. It's Amen. It's, it's systematic. I, you have to understand. It's 
not by chance. This is not by chance. It's all designed by God. It's, a, it's working together. The thing about it and what it gives us shortcomings is that we don't see the we don't see it. God sees it. We have to trust that what God is doing and preparing for us is sufficient rather than us. We don't see the full scope of it. We, we say we're spiritual, but we don't have that spiritual understanding or that foresight. That's that area of God that so many people get that foreknowledge that God has. He has an ability to work all things out for our good systematically. And all we have to do is have faith and walk through it. We just have to go blindly through it and just trust that God is taking us in the direction that he desires us to go into. Because walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. That, that, in a nutshell, walk by faith, not by sight. Because we don't, we don't know. We just have to trust what God is doing is God's purpose and God's will being played out in our life. When we do that, then we are really doing things in the manner that is going to be pleasing to God. Okay? Uh, for good. We made a reference to this already as well. God's for good is based upon what? Salvation. Purpose. His purpose, which is what? All men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's that's the ultimate. It's, it's the will of God. That's the, which is the will of God. Right. Anything contrary to his purpose is not good. The only thing that's for good is that his, is his purpose be accomplished. You ever recognize that? Ever see, everything else pales in comparison to God's purpose being accomplished. So, that, so when we look at this verse and try to break down every aspect of it, all things working together for good, what is the good? The good is that God's will be accomplished. That's all we... Be caring about Amen. not our will and our desires, but God's will and God's desires. Because, see, the fact of the matter is that some of these things that we're going through are going to be very uncomfortable. You got a verse? Oh, yeah, Philippians 2 13. Yes, read that for me. For it's God who's working in you both the will and to do His good pleasure. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's God's will. So, this is how God systematically has taken over. And this is this is the this is where we want to actually show people when it's God's will, uh, that. That it is his will to do his good pleasure in our particular lives, it shows us that now it's, we're out of the equation and now God is totally involved in everything that should be done in our lives. In fact, let me turn there real briefly. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2. Which verse is it? 2 verse For it is God. Uh, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. How, now, this is what I want to ask you. How is it God's will? I mean, how is it to will? How, is it, how, does, it, how does God put that in you to will his good pleasure? How does that happen? How does God transfer that? that word, word by that renew, renew, which wow. Jesus. Amen. You see what he's saying here? See? The acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you that is in Christ Jesus. You have to acknowledge what God's will is in order for you to work that will out. And once you do that, you will recognize that God's will will be done in you and to do his good pleasure. So once you get the will of God, it's going to be your desire to do the will of God. But that's where the trans the transformed mind comes in that. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to take on the mind of Christ so that we can begin to do what God would have us to do. We're still just walking down the line here. We just want to kind of fill this verse out. We just want to fill this verse out just a touch here. This is the area here. Look what it says. To them that love God. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. To them that love God. Seven and nine. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to the thousand generations. How was, um, how was it, 
how was it defined in time past that somebody loved God? How would you know that? They kept the commandments. They kept his commandments. See that if right. and even in the gospels it says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So directly associated with loving God. And if you love God, these things will be true about you that, um, just like it says in Romans, the 8th chapter, if you love God, uh, all these things will, be, will manifest themselves in your life. In this particular case, they had to keep the commandments. Turn to Nehemiah. Uh, well, turn to Psalms, for time's sake, Psalms 145. Psalms 145. Now we, we're proclaiming that this Romans passage is an interdispensational truth, but I want to show you how it played itself out in time past. Now, Psalms 145 and 20. Look what it says here. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. So again, we're looking at God talking about these individuals that love him. The individuals that are doing an extension of love toward God in time past, they would show that love by keeping the law. In the dispensation of the grace of God, just like I showed you, the individuals that love God has been accomplished the moment they trusted the fact that Christ died for their sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day. You understand that? See, it's a different thing here. Who, who kept the law? Christ. Christ kept the law on their behalf, so that's already been fulfilled. So now the moment you believe, just like we were talking about, from belief to the fulfillment of your hope, that patience is beginning to work in your life automatically now. Because that's already accomplished. God is not worried about whether you love him or not. God extended the love for you. I mean, Jesus Christ has extended the love portion for you. Now God is just waiting for you to be a willing participant in your sanctification. And oftentimes individuals don't do that because they do not study to show themselves approved. The problem is we cannot do anything on God's behalf if we don't have God's information in us. Oftentimes we don't put the information in us, so therefore we don't be we're not beneficial to what God is trying to do. Romans 8. To them that love God. 1 Corinthians 2:9. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for who? Them that love him. See, this whole issue here, we're talking about the individuals that, that, that love God, the extension of God toward back to him. And that's accomplished for the person who trusted in Christ. That's accomplished by the person who trusted in Christ. That's already um, an accomplishment. Now, lastly, in this verse, before we go on to the next, well, we'll start that next week, the whole uh, aspect of actually showing it. Because what we want to do, we want to show you what this looks like. My whole thing, what I'm getting to, I want to show you what it looks like in the dispensation of grace when we talk about, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That looks a certain way, and it looks very uncommon to what we see in our in our day to day walk today. And uh, Brother McNeeka actually took, uh, uh, talk, uh, dealt with one of the portions that we're going to look at next week as we begin to show and illustrate how that looks. God's working out um, in us. But the last portion of this, I just want to bring. Um, actually, I, I jumped ahead with that. To them who are called according to His purpose. We recognize that we are part of God's purpose, but we have to recognize which part of God's purpose we are a part of. Which part are we a part of? We are part of God's heavenly purpose. So we know this is how we fit the bill. The moment you trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ, the fact that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, you became a part of his heavenly purpose because now you are referred to as an ambassador for Christ. Ambassador meaning that God has you down here on a foreign mission 
telling individuals about the goodness of God and how they can attain, uh, obtain eternal life based upon believing the message of reconciliation that he's committed to our trust. So when we see this and when we share this message, we're going to, the next week, we're going to look at how this actually works out in the life of a believer. And I believe it's going to really show some things to us that are going to expose some, 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 some error in people's understanding as it pertains to um, all things working together for good. Because I know I've quoted it for a lot of times, but oftentimes people don't really fully grasp the understanding of what that, this verse means. Any comments or questions? I love in connection, and, and I know you may be going, you know, somewhere else, but I love Ephesians chapter 1, 9 and 10, and still a connection to everything that you are saying today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, Pastor, if, if you want to read it and you can see the word, you know, uh, pleasure, his will, purpose, all things, and see who they in, and I'll let you just expound for, on a, for a Ephesians, what's one now? Chapter 1, verse 9, nine and 10. 10. And it got both purposes in mind. Amen, amen. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Amen. That summarizes... What we show in here. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Yes, sir. And that's the fullness of what we show. I praise God for bringing that verse in because that's ultimately what we're showing. We're talking about the purpose of God. We want to recognize that you, you meet that description the moment you trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ. You've been grafted in to God's heavenly purpose from this vantage point. We wanted to show that this is... When we that particular ver verse in Romans, when it talks about um, that are called according to his purpose, is not just talking about us today. It's talking about for all time. They're going to be able to say that all the time. That's one of the verses that are interdispensational truth, that if you're called according to his purpose, God is uh, He's orchestrating that all things work together for your good. So that's definitely a great uh, verse to pull in. So when you, when you say all things, and, and like Magnesia said, um, when you use the example of um, Joseph being sold, sold into slavery mm -hmm. and how that's going to work to bring about God's purpose. And then, you, you, and then you're looking at all things. And I know we had a conversation before about things that happen in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So are you saying everything that happened in your life Is to bring about the purpose. Is to bring about this purpose that you that you explained today. Not one thing that happens in your life is outside of God's purpose for what's supposed to happen in your life. Not one thing. And and, it, and and whatever happens in your life is is the ultimate purpose for that thing happening in your life is to reconcile the heavens and the earth back to Christ. Well. As it, as it pertains to your role as an could ambassador you, you for said Christ. Not, not just spiritual, but physical. Yeah, because right now we these are a part of the infirmities that we have to deal with. So when God is causing all things to work together for your good, He's not going. To, he's not subtracting your physical infirmities from anything else as it pertains to accomplishing your goal. He has all bases covered every aspect. You have you don't have to worry about any of the ads. Every base covered. Your physical and your spiritual. Everything is covered. And it's, his whole purpose of that is so that it'll accomplish his purpose. But God is not causing the evil. There's things that because we live in a sin-cursed world when these things come upon us God is not causing them to come upon us but he's giving us the ability to He's using those situations and giving us the ability to give him glory and deal with them and go through them. Amen. That's why when we read the verse, it's, it's not it's not talking about cause. Look what it's We're look what it's actually saying. For good. Yeah, for all yeah. things. It's like all of like we already read in Romans eight where uh, creation grown it together. We grown it together in pain. All that those things are emotion. But what God is saying. 
His providence already knows those things that, that are happening. He's saying that my plan for you is working in spite of what's already in motion. It, it is not going to allow those things that are already in motion to subtract from what I'm doing for you. I got my plan for you coincides with whatever catastrophe or whatever else happens. I'm going to still allow you to accomplish your goal. It's not going to cause me like, oh, I didn't know that was there. Now I got to try to reroute you. No, I got a route for you that's 100% full. Go ahead. Hey, man, you, wow. Did you, how you started it was the big deal for the sake of what, what I'm saying is the proceedings before we got to Romans 8 and 28. I believe it was detrimental that we go to Romans 5. Amen. You, you, you understand? And it's not finished. I mean, this this is really, I only got to the beginning of the introduction. Next week, we're going to go into some other passages right. that's really going to open this up. But we had to get that understanding first because tribulation, work, experience, faith, experience, experience, hope. We have to show how it's both spiritual and physical. Right. I mean, yes, 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 yes. yes. So, but for the sake of someone saying, well, how can that be? How can you say work together for good? How Amen. understanding the systematic thing of how the word of God effectually works in you Amen. and out of you and through you. Romans 5, verse 3 and 4 was like detrimental to and we know. Absolutely. And we know. And 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 we know. And for the sake of us looking to give God glory, we gotta understand that system. Amen. And then that's for good, like you said, it, 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 seeing, that's it the key. The, seeing it through God's eyes. It's perspective. Good. It's perspective. That's the whole thing. We see sometimes we get caught up on earthly perspective, and that's not God. God is done with that. We're dead in our life is seated in Christ yes, in sir. God. Yes, sir. So God is really the only thing that, and that's what Paul is really trying. He's trying to get us to put on our spiritual vision because that's the only thing at the end that's going to make a difference. So the more we grasp and stay hold to that, the more beneficial we'll be. Sometimes we get sidetracked and start looking at physical things and get overcome by them. But God is saying, stay focused. Stay focused. Don't be distracted mm -hmm. on those things that are not a part of, you know, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to take you. So it, that's really where you need to keep your focus at. Your perspective is every, is what really, really counts. You're no longer mm -hmm. in the earthly, physical realm as it pertains to the flesh. You're in the spirit. And once you grasp that, everything is working together because this new creature that you are, it's only spiritual. But it's in a physical body, so the things that happen in the physical realm, you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. But God has already overcome those. They have a spiritual, I mean, they, at least to a spiritual ending, though, like a reward or a, or a loss of right. opportunity. Right. Absolutely. Opportunity. Absolutely. I had a question, because I've heard this, Todd, I actually heard this, this verse mentioned by another grace believer who I believe understood a lot of what we understand. And we understand that the uh, like the chapters, the numbers, the punctuation, that's not inspired in scripture. His thought was that in verse twenty eight, there were kind of like a parentheses in there. Romans eight yeah, twenty eight. Yeah, Romans eight twenty eight, where it says the parentheses would, would be to them that love God, to them who are the call. And the actual verse would read, And we know that all things work together for good according to his purpose. And the parentheses would be around would be to them that are called. So then that would mean that the according to his purpose would, would refer to all things working together for good instead of them who are called. Now that changed a little bit. Not, I mean, it's not, maybe it's not major, but it, it definitely would change. I mean, if that was the case, I'm just throwing it out there. It changes it drastically. It, it changes, changes it it drastically. Just, the reason it would change it is because we had to... We had to define who those that loved the Lord was. And this is how I figured out who loved the Lord and how God took care of that for us. Because if you, it says, to them that love God. Who is this? Them that are our, our saved and in Christ. Right, who is this? We have to try to figure out who this is. Who's those that love God? So now I'm trying to gauge, do you love him? Do you love him? Because if you don't really love him, this doesn't apply to you. What makes, what defines whether you love him or not? It has nothing to do with... It has nothing to do with your extension. The way you live. How do I know it? Because now he gathered it and he, 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 he equated it with them who are called... 
really didn't have to go any further. Those who are saved in Christ. Who's called? The saved. How do you know they called? Everybody's called. Every, everybody that's believed, they were called. Yeah, so now he saved. qualified it and brought everything together. This is just added. This is extra information mm -hmm. according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. But the qualifier was to them who are called. The people who are called is the people who love God. But I don't love God. You were called. What Jesus Christ accomplished for you benefited you because it extended God's love uh, from you, God's love. Why? Because it comes from the body of Christ. And not you individually. This is what summarizes and puts you in this category that you know that this operation is working for you and not just you, not you, but you, not you, but you. It's all of us. Because see, somebody would want to take this verse and say, yeah, but you got to love God. And that's Romans 8 and 30. And if you don't love it, if, if, if you keep his commandment, now they want to bring some work into it to qualify if you are part of this thing that, that works systematically for you. But God already took care of that. Romans 8 and 30? Romans 8 30. It goes right down. Romans 8 30. Right you mentioned, for the sake of the call, when it really. Moreover, right. Amen. Moreover, whom he predestinated, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So we see that the, it's, it's always going to link up. And this, this brings that further because we always talked about justified connecting itself to glorify, mm -hmm. but now we see how important the call say is that. because the call is what qualifies you for this to be working on your behalf. I don't want to get too deep on this stuff here. Awesome. Praise God. But you see, what we're saying is that there's some things that we need to know collectively within the, within the, the members of the body of Christ in order for us to be edified. This is stuff we need to know. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, you know the good news is that it's already been done by the operation of God. And it all it really ties together when you get into 2 Timothy, in chapter 4 and verse 8, where it says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, should give me in that day, not to me only, but unto all them that also have brought me to you. You see? So, but now who's, who's, who's that going to be now? You see, that's them saved individuals. That's something that you can give God the glory through Jesus Christ again because he's accomplished something that is going to give you an eternal way to glory. Amen. See, I figure out that, of course, we're going to get different levels of reward based upon gold, silver, and precious stones. But there's an accomplishment that has already been provided for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf that gives us the victory and gives us an accomplishment in Christ that we should be thankful for right now. Amen. I mean, next week, bring it. I mean, we're really going to get into some things that's going to deal with this verse. This really was introduction. I haven't even, you see, notice I haven't really got to the verses on my notes. But this is the fact, I really wanted to go through that. And I didn't know how much time that was going to take. But I just really wanted to make sure we were all lined up on that's the right. same page. Right. Because next week, we're going to really go into the verses that connect with that. And take it back to the Old Testament and show how... We need to have. Yeah, I will take it. Amen. Amen. We'll take it we got stuff in the New Testament too. The Philippian jailer. So to speak, but that Old Testament really some things. It's no. I'm looking at it. It's no mistake that the things that were written the fourth time were written for our comfort. Say that. That our patience and comfort through was the through the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, See, we have to know that there's some stuff we really need to investigate the Old Testament to the extent is in that, verse. that the comfort that we extract the mm -hmm. comfort from there. Mm -hmm. and, and doing that, we'll be able to rightly divide the doctrine. See, we know that the law aspect of it didn't apply to us, the keeping the law, but we know that by him, by them loving God, God was going to work all Ooh. things out together for them good. You know, so we'll see how to yes, rightly sir. divide and extract that. Yes. Well, you even see you David with Bathsheba. Amen. And that whole system from the beginning up to the end of that, how that worked out. You see what I'm saying? It just was a terrible circumstance. But look what happened during the process of it. What was produced from it. You know, Solomon. You see what I'm saying? So God's, in other words, there's just live your life and give glory to God. God is going to work it out ultimately so that you'll 
get, you know, you'll be equipped to fulfill his purpose in your life. Don't get destitute. You're, you're saved from the anxiety that comes from, man, am I doing the most that I could do for God? Do what you can do, and God is going to fulfill the rest of it. He's doing it. It's not. It's, it's just him working through you in the, for the most part anyway. Yeah, just uh, when we're talking about uh, all things working out for good, that's the purpose of God. We understand the, the, under, uh, the relationship that we have of being one with Christ. And you look at Hebrews 12, too. He says, look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down in the right hand of God. That's what Jesus did, and it brought him joy. Mm -hmm. But what's he telling us? Present your body a living sacrifice, holy and blameless, which is your reasonable service. That's right. And that's going to bring us joy. Amen. And it's going to bring tribulation, work, and patience. All these things that God is mm -hmm. is what's going to be manifest in us. Absolutely. So that we can also be used as vessels uh, for the glory. Absolutely. That is so important. And we talk about being um, uh, driven to. Uh, conform to the image of his son, right. the conformity of his son. That we're gonna talk about that next week too. But all these things work together for the fact that God is that's what He's doing. He's conforming us to the image of His Son, and that that, that process happens the moment you believe. Some of us are distracted with worldly things rather than being mind and conscious of what God is doing. And it just uh, we're over time. Let's bow for prayer. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had today to come together and be edified one with another. Lord, we make sure that we uh, intercede on behalf of those that are not saved today, those that don't believe. We have thanksgiving in our heart. We, we, we are thankful on their behalf, Lord God, for what you've accomplished through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you open the door of utterance that we can share with them the glorious good news that you've provided for us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We also pray for the leaders of countries, Lord God, so that we can live peaceful on, on earth amongst of each other, Lord God, in this, in this time, in this dispensation that we live in. And Lord, we just pray that something was said today that will cause us to grow to a greater knowledge of all that you've accomplished for us through Jesus Christ, so that we can be more effective, effective ambassadors for Christ's sake. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name.